In our uh, previous classes, we have uh, discussed regarding the town planning and we are in continuation of the town planning process. Like we have seen how the streets are arranged, what is citadel, what is the lower town, you know, what kind of structures were built in citadel, all such detailed information we have studied in our previous classes. So, in today's class, we will see how the houses are built by the Harappans. So, they are part of the planning, right? So, let's see how these houses are built, what are the features of their houses and all such details. The all such details we got only through the excavations made. So, the excavations were done extensively along the banks of river, you know, Har I mean, uh, Indus and the remains of the walls of the houses and all such things uh, they came or they were just uh, excavated and when they found no, the scientists could come to an understanding or the archaeologists could come to an understanding how the houses might have looked and you know, what is the uh, features of it. The main characteristics of the houses were the following. The residential buildings. What do you mean by residential buildings? The buildings which are used to live and are used by generally common people. So where we reside, that means people you know they use homes for residing, staying. Such buildings are called residential buildings. Why this separation is done here? Because there are some public buildings also we have seen in Harappan, right? Like there's a uh, assembly hall in uh, Mohenjo-da, I mean Harappa. Hence, to make us uh, you know differentiate between that kind of building and this, they use the word residential building. Here the residential building is the buildings which are used to living, generally for living purpose. They were built according to a set of plan on a high mound in order to protect them from lights. So here, you know, they built like a platform kind of thing which is called mound and on this you note know, they built the house. So if you look at the picture here, so here this is already, you know, the, the ground is already called the mound. And on this, you know, they built the houses. So why they built houses like this? Because to protect them from flood water entering into their houses. If it is on a high platform to a level, they can protect themselves from the flood waters to avoid, you know, uh, to enter into their houses. So they just built their houses. So this mound was, you know, simply something like this and on this high uh, raised platform, they built the houses and there were variations in the size of houses. So on one way, they built houses on a mound, which is, you know, like circular platform kind of thing. And why they built this kind of circular platforms? Because to protect themselves from floods and the foundations were also very deep. So the foundations laid for houses were very, very deep. So that even now if earthquakes and all comes, they can protect themselves. So along with this, there were variations in the size of houses from single room tenements to bigger houses with courtyards. There were some places with single, uh, you know, the houses are of different uh, sizes. There were houses with single room, okay. Also, there were houses with multi-storied buildings, they are called tenements. You can see here the tenement kind of structures. There are also single houses with single rooms and with courtyard. I told you what is courtyard, right? So this is a place inside, you know, where uh, you'll get a lot of open area kind of thing. And there are houses with even up to 12 rooms, such a big houses private wells and toilets is such an advanced way of uh, living style they have followed. So even today, you don't have any much difference between the planning of house, right? We have rooms, we have our own water facilities and toilets. So in the same manner, they had their private wells, the only source. See, private well in the sense, the well is used by only that family which is living in the houses. So each house had covered drains connected with street drains. That means, so if a house is there, okay, then the drain will be covered inside. It will not be open inside. From the inside house, this, suppose you take washroom is there. 
and from this washroom the drain will be underground and you may get doubt are they using any pipes and all no through brick construction only they used to make uh, underground uh, closed drainage system and this is called house drain and this house drain will open into a street drain so every house will connect its house drain to street drain so the water will flow from street drain to outskirts of the city see how what an advanced way of planning they have made and the entrances to the houses were from the narrow lanes which cut the streets at right angles so if you take this as a street okay this is a street you can see you know a cart going here and the way they're very narrow they're not so broad and all they're very narrow and these entrances they cut the street at right angles see this is the entrance of the house and this is the street so they are cutting the street at right angle so they are cutting the street at right angle so that you know that's how they planned it's not there is no much uh, detail information on that but the yellow color portion which you are seeing that shows that this is the entrance of the house and they are cutting the streets narrowly at right angles the kitchen was placed in a sheltered corner at the courtyard and the ground floor contained storerooms and well chambers so kitchen was placed in the courtyard so generally what they used to do they used to place the kitchen in the courtyard which is an open area left and what they do they used to uh, you know like protect the kitchen because they store all the you know like food and all was prepared there so they took care of protection of that also and the ground floor contained store rooms and well chambers so whatever food grains and all they prepared so they used to store in the storage houses in the underground and also chambers well chambers you know like uh, they used to fetch water from the private wells i said so that wells were also in the ground floor and only they used to live in the upper floor and the houses were made up of brick and wood so they used both brick and wood for building their houses each house has doors windows and ventilators so what do they have they have house sorry ventilators ventilators means like same no windows and all doors and windows opened on the side of the street if you look at the picture here okay if you look at this particular uh, picture here the thing which i am drawing here see the window is opened to the street not to the main road if this you consider as a main road they do not have any windows on this side they only have windows on the street side and not on the main road that's what i was saying if you consider this as main road and this as a street okay and this street is passing like this and when this is street is passing this is main road the houses will not have windows to the main road only to the narrow streets they have open windows and ventilators you can see here the window opening to the side of the street so this is about the houses so granaries are another important structures that reveals you know how the harappans have uh, you know had the technology of uh, storing the food grains the granaries are nothing but they are the storehouses of the food grains so whatever food grains they have grown they used to store in certain separate areas even today if you see uh, we call them as you know go downs and all in similar manner they have used granaries so at several sites such granaries have been discovered by archaeologists Mohenjo-daro, it was found. Harappa, it was found. Lothal and Kalibangan, all these places, the archaeologists have found certain kind of granary structures. See how can they say that this particular structure is granary and the other structure is not a granary? That we will discuss now. So the archaeologists found there are two rows of six granaries each to the south of granaries at Harappa. Sorry, to the south 
at harappan say you know what we'll see see what is this two rows of six grandes this is one row look at the picture and this is another row okay and one two three four five and six similarly here one two three four five and six two rows and six granaries each okay so this was found at harappa and the working floors were also discovered which consists of rows of circular brick platforms so the archaeologists could reconstruct the structure of this granary so what the, suppose you look at the picture here the picture not down to the one they have imagined like this or they have reconstructed this uh, granary like this there were circular brick flat platforms this is the circular brick platform which you can see here and what was the purpose of these circular brick platforms in a granary it is believed that these floors were meant for threshing grain because wheat and barley grains were found in the crevices of the floors so what do they use this circular brick platforms they keep all the wheat barley whatever you know food grains that they have grown and they used to beat with sticks like that you know to remove that husk which is called the outer coat of the grains and this process of beating the grains with you know such kind of wooden logs or whatever it is it is called threshing okay and they were found in the under i mean uh, at the ground floor level so these granaries now you can think that they are multi storied buildings and at the ground floor they have such circular brick, brick platforms and into which they have uh, they add all the food grains i know suppose wheat they add they beat the wheat so that the husk or the outer coat of the grain will be separated and so archaeologists have even found that in the crevices of the floors suppose if this circular brick this is circular brick platform and they started beating in here is the started beating crevices of the floors miss so a narrow cuts okay on the floor there will be very minute narrow cuts on it archaeologists have found some kind of food grains here wheat grains all such things you no know, grain they found not with the outer coat and all they found the grains because while beating you no know, they might have gone and you know, they might have got stuck in this kind of narrow spaces in the ground so then they assumed that maybe they used to thresh the grains here and there were also two roomed barracks which possibly accommodated laborers so within the granary they used to have some kind of living provision the laborers who do this kind of threshing and not storing the food grains they were given accommodation inside the granary itself so they are called barracks and they have been found at harappa the location of harappa near the river ravi suggests that food grains were brought to this place by boat so they have built granaries uh, in harappa why do you think they have built had granaries in only in, i mean in harappa because harappa has some uh, you know the tributary of indus river ravi will flow there so as ravi river is there and it is easy for transportation they also built granaries nearby rivers so that the transportation becomes easy otherwise if it is very far away from rivers and some other isolated places it is difficult to transport so they built granaries at wherever the rivers are flowing and it was built on a raised platform to protect it from floods so again the same thing the granaries were built at a height okay they built a higher platform on which they built this granaries the granary so what was the purpose to protect from flood water entering into suppose if river suddenly floods come the river water may rise and they may enter into granaries the food grains may spoil so if it is at a higher altitude then they can protect that granary and food material the granary had ventilation to prevent grains from becoming mildewed so they also provided certain kind of ventilation windows kind of thing protective ventilation why because if if air circulation is not free the grains may uh, become spoiled so mildewed means they should not get spoiled with kind of you know the fungus and all kind of things 
so what they did they have provided even ventilation so that was the architectural you know like um, greatness of the granaries built by indus valley people so now uh, now let us understand the trade that harappans did we know that they, they carried trade through the rivers and what kind of trade they were operating how the trade carried on we will see now the elaborate social structure and standard of living confirmed by the presence of granaries numerous seals uniform script regulated weights and measures in a wide area indicate the existence of a highly developed system of trade see the archaeologists they have discovered some materials how do you know that see nobody has seen you cannot just visualize that the trade has happened but how do you know the trade got carried in a advanced manner by harappans how can one establish first thing that we can confirm is presence of granaries sorry elaborate social structure so the society was organized you have seen the you know the citadel area with the palaces kind of thing and you no know, big structures uh, like you know great bath and all standard of living the way they lived the the drainages they built it's a most a civilized form of living isn't it that i know that is another important factor which shows how people are advanced and presence of granaries see whenever we produce excess of uh, food material they stored some of it they transport only when we produce excess we think about you know trade and other things when we grow for ourselves we use it ourselves when we grow more than what we require only then we think of uh, transporting it or uh, you know trading it so presence of granaries reveals that they produced excess food grains than what they require so they are storing and they are transporting them for trade that reveals that they have trade also uniform script and regulated weights and measures so throughout the civilization they maintained only one script which shows that all people you know they had common links with each other i mean i'm talking about the cities of civilization mohenjo-daro you take harappa you take kalibangan you take kar you take uh, Uh, what a whichever place you take in indus valley civilization they all followed a common script that shows that they all were interlinked with each other that shows that they had transportation with each other that why do they transport ultimately for trade only and uniform weights and measures you go to whichever place in the indus valley sites they found uniform weights and measures so the trade was carried on with measurements so these are the these are the kinds of things which the archaeologists have found the deeper layers of earth when they excavated certain regions you now weights and measures nowadays we use certain kinds of uh, you now weighing stones and all so they used this kind of weighing stones and all and that shows this all factor shows that there was a highly developed trade with harappans there is abundant evidence that the harappans traded not only with other parts of india but also with many countries of asia there was not only inland trade that means within harappan region or within indus valley regions trade was there but not only they didn't limited themselves to within indus valley they have even traveled to other places if you look at the site here this is the place of indus valley civilization and you know they have traveled to many areas and now see you take here the mesopotamian civilization the red color line which is shown here reveals their uh, you know roots and the blue color line you know see how nicely they they traveled through seas gujarat we learned about lothal a dockyard is there you know in a, through a narrow channel they lead into arabian sea and through arabian sea again you know, they enter through different places other parts of asia Harappans carried on considerable trade in stone, metal, shells, etc. So they used stones, metals, and shells for carrying on the trade. So as a means of exchange or what you whatever you say, no, they might have uh, transported some precious stones. They have exported some metal objects, shells which are of precious uh, thing. 
and within the Indus Valley Civilization, sorry, zone. So, with the stones, that means the precious stones from one area to another area, metals from one area to another, like that they used to transport many things. In some cases, common products have been found in all the areas indicating some kind of trade. When similar kind of products available in all the areas, that shows that those all places are interlinked with each other. And if rivers are connecting them, definitely they might have transported these things to, uh, in the form of a trade. They, however, did not use metal currency because metal money was not found anywhere. Only metal objects were uh, used for uh, you know trade purpose, like you know they used to export metal objects, whatever they made and all. But they never used metal as a currency kind of thing. But like no coins were found, if if you want to say. But carried on all exchanges through a barter system. So what is barter system? They give one product and equal uh, they take a product of another equal value. So. That was the primitive form of trade that man learned. Suppose if a fisherman is there, he, he generally catches fishes. I know what he does. He gives a fishes to a, a, a farmer and the farmer gives whatever he grows to him and which is of equal value. And you know, like that they used to exchange whatever they have. If you have one thing, you give me and I'll give you whatever I have. This kind of trade was operational during those times. So barter economy, you can call us the economy as barter economy, where which is exchange of goods of equal value. So the Harappans also had different kind. We'll see what kind of things they have traded. We know how what kind of trade they operated. Now we'll see what kind of trade, uh, you know, what things they exactly, you know, traded. Cities like Mohenjo-daro and Harappa and Lothal were important centers for metallurgy. So, Mohenjo-daro, Harappa and Lothal, these three places of Indus Valley region, they served as centers for metallurgy. What is metallurgy here? Making objects through metals, extraction of metals, you know, making these metals for uh, useful for objects and all such kind of detail. Uh, you just mix two, three metals and make another metal which is more stronger and all this kind of process and all metallurgy deals with that. Producing tools and weapons as well as kitchenware and other objects. With metals, Harappans have made certain tools, weapons, and kitchenware. I mean, the things which they, you can see here. You know, like tools, you can see here the picture. Kitchenware, you can see here with metals they made. And also, they made certain other objects, like, you know, jewels and other things they also made with metals. Rice seems to have been imported to Punjab from Gujarat, Lothal, and Sarkatada. So, and Sarkatada cotton for the expanding townships of Mohenjo-daro, Harappa, and Banawali. See, during those days, Mohenjo-daro, Harappa, and Banawali, they were trade-wise, they were, you know, progressing uh, places. So, they used to import many things. So, like, you know, from Punjab, the Punjab people, like, you know, where, suppose exa exactly, you know, here, where this uh, Harappa is located, they used to import rice from Lothal, because Lothal has a dockyard, and from there, you know, they can easily transport it to the Harappan uh, site. And the Sarkatada cotton they used to take from Sarkatada areas. And... The trade was mostly focused on the areas of Mohanjadaro, Harappa and Banawali, of course, Lothal. So they exported and they had trade with different kinds of objects. Balakot and Chanhudaro were centers, centers for bangle making. Lothal and Chanhudaro were centers for manufacturing of beads. So here we were trying to understand what, which place is famous for what kind of trade? Balakot and Chanhudaro. These two places are famous for bangle making. You can see here the uh, excavations of bangles. They were found in the, along with the clay and mud. Okay, when they were excavated from deeper layers, they found the bangles in that region. So these are the metal bangles. So that shows that there might be a site here for bangle making. It was a bangle making factory you can call it like that 
Palakot and Chanhudaro. And Lothal and Chanhudaro are centers for manufacturing of beads. So beads are nothing but now like metallic, uh, you know, small kind of uh, structures. They look like this. And they use mostly for you know, jewelry making and all. So Lothal and Chanhudaro were centers of such bead making. And besides the internal trade, that means there was trade between different places of Indus Valley. Along with that, the Harappans also had commercial contacts with Western neighbors. So not only with the, the local Indus places, they also had their Western, this is the Western side, right? So this is the Western side and they had even contacts with the Western people, especially the Lothal, Sarpatoda and Balakot were the important coastal towns with Mesopotamia. So Mesopotamia had contacts with Harappans, understood? So especially Lothal, and now Sarkatoda and Balakot, these areas, they were having contacts with the Mesopotamian civilization. And they also had set up a trading colony in Northern Afghanistan, which facilitated trade with Central Asia. So if you take this, as uh, you know civilization side here comes you now Afghanistan and all so with trade for Central Asian uh, you know uh, places what they did they also established a trading center here so that they can bring all the goods and products there and from there they can export it to the Central Asia such was the you know case with the trade of Harappan So just now, just now, we have understood that there was not only inland trade, that means they were not also having trade between their Indus Valley sites, but they also had trade with the western part of the world. So especially with the Mesopotamian region. The Mesopotamian records, how do archaeologists conclude with this, that they had trade with the Mesopotamians? That we will see now. The Mesopotamian records from 2350 BC it gave an important information that they had trade relations with Meluha. See, the Mesopotamians referred this Indus Valley region as Meluha. This is the Mesopotamian region and this is Meluha. So, the Mesopotamians called this Indus Valley seat, the records of Mesopotamians said that they had trade relations with Meluha and which was the ancient name given to Indus region. The Mesopotamian texts refer to two intermediate trading stations called Dilmum and Makan. So, see, they, had, they didn't go directly to you know Indus Valley said from Mesopotamia. They didn't travel directly to uh, you know where the sites are present. But there were some intermediate trading stations. What do they have? Intermediate trading stations. These people they go there and Mesopotamians used to come here. For example, the Mesopotamian records mentioned a place called Dilman. Okay. And this Dilman and Makan. Okay. So same thing here. Dilman and Makan. They lay between Mesopotamia and Meluha. Right. This is Mesopotamia and this is Meluha. This Dilman and Makan are intermediate trading stations for both people. And this, there is a, a mentioning of these two places in Mesopotamian records, why do you think Mesopotamians will come to Dilman and Magan? Because very close to these places, Meluha is present. Hence, they understood that Mesopotamians and Indus Valley people had some trade contacts. So this Dilman, had, I told you that Arapans have established a trading colony in Afghanistan for trading with Central Asia. So this is Central Asian part and they come here and they establish the trading colonies at Magan and Dilma so that they can have a close contact with Mesopotamian trade. Possibly the trade with these countries used to be carried out by sea. So no other way, Arabian Sea, they have to carry the trade. Mesopotamian texts refer to Meluha as a land of seafarers. So they call this Meluha as a seafarers, the people, because you know they just come by boats and they again take the things and they used to go away. So they called these people as seafarers, that means the sailors who travel on sea always. Besides the depiction of ships and boats on seals also indicate this. 
so we should also have an understanding that they might have whether they have used the ships or not until unless we know whether ships are used or not we can't we cannot confirm that they carried on sea trade they, on a seal the archaeologists have found a boat or a ship kind of thing then it it make it tells us to understand that yes they know how to make boats and ships otherwise why would they make such kind of seal isn't it so this also revealed that yes they carried on trade with sea the harappan merchants were exporting to and importing goods from west and central asian sites so from western part and central asia they used to export and import various things and gold was imported from north karnataka so to the southern parts of india they had contacts especially you know in the northern part of karnataka you know they got they, there was a uh, you know link there are some evidences available and they used to take gold from that place afghanistan also they collected gold copper they took from rajasthan those areas the availability of copper was more and also south india they took copper baluchistan and arabia so all these things they used for their metal trade so they obtained different metals from these different places and lead was also lead another metal was obtained from east or southern part of india so this was about their contacts and these kind of things they used to transport to the mesopotamians and in return they get something from that places so they have used certain weights and measures okay for trade purpose they use certain weights and measures a number of stone weights were discovered at from the excavations the harappan people used nets of cubical stone weights so these are the cubical structures and this is how their you know weighing balance looks they keep this cubical weights here and they measure whatever they want to give the larger weights were multiples of 16 basically you know the their measurement starts with 16 okay so this large suppose the basic like we call uh, no no it is like 1 kg stone you take in similar manner they start with one cubical weight with starting weight as 16 they call it as 16 those days this what happened suppose you take this one this is the basic unit of measurement it is uh, 16 in their records but if you weigh with modern weighing balances it is having a weight of 14 grams how many grams 14 grams so their basic weight started with 14 grams or we take 16 as per their records and the other weights are multiples of 16 like you take 32 48 64 and 128 so they are all the multiples suppose you take 14 grams so like you know 28 so like that it goes 56 in modern uh, weighing technology in their weighing technology 32 48 64 and 128 and the smaller ones were all fractions of 16 so if there are some smaller ones they are like fractions of that cubical weights basically the standard weight they have is 16 and the higher weights they go for multiply multiples of 16 you can just uh, read out the 16th table that comes the multiples of 16 and smaller ones will be fraction of 16 so that's how their weights and measures were there they are found in harappan excavations what about the transport several representations of ships were found on the seals at harappa and mohenjodaro so as we have seen in the previous slide where you no know, like uh, a seal was present with a ship symbol that shows that they know the art of making ships a terracotta model of a ship was also discovered from lothal so terracotta is a kind of clay a clay model of ship was also found uh, in lothal which was a boat kind of thing and the boats were also used to carry goods from production centers to cities so what was the purpose of a building boat wherever the products are produced and they have to be carried and transported to the place of sale so the boats were used for inland travel and there is also another means one means of transport is boats and the other means of transport is bullock carts okay 
you can see the picture here there were many cop there there are some uh, you know uh, i mean this kind of cart creations were done with terracotta clay even copper and bronze models of carts were found with seated drivers you can see here the person was sitting carrying the goods made of clay you know the animals were uh, catalysts driving the cart and they were found from harappa and chanhudaru okay so chanhudaru harappa can you remember what chanhudaru is famous for bangles right so many such things even uh, you know many other uh, metal objects were also found in chanhudaru carts in used in those days resemble the modern ekka which is called horse cart it resembles you no know, modern days horse cart kind of thing so that's how the transportation was there with harappans and these are the evidences you now the models they made they served as evidences for archaeologists to understand that they had this kind of transport